Hello and welcome back to Parlay. This prompt was written by The Last Grey Rice about their custom Magic the Gathering set based on the setting of the Project Moon games, so Limbus Company, Library of Ruina, and Lobotomy Corporation. I have a custom Magic the Gathering set using Project Moon City setting. I guess it'd be a, a Universes Beyond set, like the recent Lord of the Rings set, fully draftable and around modern legal power level. Yeah, a little higher than normal sets. I wanted to make the set as realistic to a set release as possible, with a goal to capture the quirky mechanics of abnormalities as a build around, while the gameplay, generally, feels more like a focused encounter in Limbus Company or Ruina. I don't really have people to play around me who play both games to talk about this, but I will be doing some playtesting with friends who play Magic once I get the commons, uncommons, and the bonus sheet done, and wanted to throw around some ideas with someone who plays a Project Moon game and plays Magic. Yeah, cool. Currently, I have the set mechanics and most commons done, and some ideas for the 10 color pair archetypes to push for. Talking about everything about the set will be way too much to fit in a parlay, yes it would be, so I'll present the main gimmick of the set here, abnormality cards. Every pack will have a dedicated slot with a low rarity abnormality card, and another card will be replaced with another abnormality card of the same rarity. Another card in the pack, I guess. Every abnormality card will be a double face card with breach on the front face, a creature with breach, I think usually, and encounter on the back face. A lot of them will hold the role of the signpost uncommons in a regular set, and a lot of the designs in the set will push toward putting cards in your graveyard to pay for the breach cost. Uh, let's take a look at them. Uh, so here's an example of one. You can see it's a creature on the front side, and then it has a mechanic called Breach that lets you play it from your graveyard, but it's the backside. And the backside is still a creature, but during your opponent's turn, it's a battle instead. A battle that you defend. We'll get into it in just a second. So Breach as a mechanic is you pay a cost, and you can cast this card transformed from your graveyard for its Breach cost. As a mechanic, very straightforward. It's a mix of the Escape and Disturb mechanics. In magic already. Escape where you can pay a cost and usually exile cards from your graveyard to play a card again from the graveyard, and Disturb where you pay a cost to play the card from your graveyard but transformed as its other side. Flavor-wise only, this is a reference to Abnormality's Breaching Containment in Lobotomy Corporation, as well as a mechanic that uses resources built up in your discard pile, like using Ego skills in Limbus Company. Abnormalities of lower threat ranks, like Zayn and Teth, will require exiling three cards. He and Wa need four, and Aleph will need a variable number higher up to eight. I have no idea if I pronounce those correctly, by the way. Um, also, it's intended that the front and back are the same name. I have a handful of build-around uncommons that ask the player to cast a card of a certain name more than once, the idea being that you could play it as its creature and then abnormality half, okay? If I cut those, I might go back to having the two faces have different names. And then here's how the encounter thing works. I said it's a battle you defend in your turn. Uh, encounter is encounter and then a number. This enters with that many defense counters. It becomes a battle you protect during opponent's turns. Likely the most complicated mechanic in the set, even with its short rules text. Currently under rules of battles, creatures that are also battles cannot attack or block. I wanted to make creatures attacking creatures as a gameplay nod to focused encounters, making it so the defending player would have to decide whether to block the attacker swinging at you or at your creature. But that was only going to work if rules were changed just for this mechanic. Also, as the defending player, I also felt games would get into stalls since your battle creatures would effectively take permanent damage if they got blocked by smaller creatures, so you wouldn't want to attack with them. Yeah, just a quick word about that. that's a, a good thing that you headed off. Right, if, if the creatures were battles all the time, and taking damage made them lose encounter counters, while they would stay at the power and toughness they were at, they would die after engaging in combat more than once. So having a creature repeatedly block, for example, would be really weak if it had those counters on it, because it would take uh, you know, no permanent damage to its toughness, but it would permanently lose its you know battle counters and then just die when it ran out of them, <laughs> which is really bad. It would be a very big nerf to defensive creatures in particular. Uh, they would essentially just be expended as soon as they engaged in combat more than once or twice. And I, I will come back to this later, but I noticed that you wisely made most of the numbers of counters that creatures have when their battles during your opponent's turn low. You know, they don't have very many. They don't need to be attacked successfully as battles during your opponent's turn very many times to, you know, do the thing and be killed. So, uh, yeah, to balance that out, it's really important that they be 
a battle and then a creature. A battle and then a creature. Very nice way to head that off. Uh, we'll we'll go back to looking at the cards in a minute, but let me finish reading the parlay. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool. Uh, the way you solve the rules problem and the gameplay problem is to make the creature be a normal creature during your turns and purely a battle during opponent's turns. This effectively makes them have this creature cannot block and can have regular stats as an attacker. This also makes them have some natural protection from sorcery speed removal, which I think is a cool design space as a threat, as I can have some pushed sorcery removal at lower rarities. This mechanic will be used specifically to represent abnormalities and horrors of the city. But kind of like Gideon Planeswalkers, he haunts the set from the remnants of War of the Spark's design. This is like War of the Spark. I'll briefly talk about that. Yeah, Magic does have a Planeswalker whose signature thing was he can turn into a creature, usually an indestructible creature, during your turn, and he'll prevent all damage done to him so that he doesn't have the problem where he kind of takes permanent damage to his loyalty counters. Uh, so this is kind of the opposite of that in a way. And then it's like War of the Spark in that there are a ton of a very normally scarce type of permanent. Normally, you know, Planeswalkers. There wouldn't be too many of them flying around. War of the Spark made many uncommon and rare Planeswalkers, so it was very different for a set. This set will feel very different on its, on its face simply because there's suddenly a ton of battles flying around. There are many different targets to attack when you attack your opponent with a creature, uh, which is not normal. And we'll get more into that later, but yeah, very distinct. Um, I definitely get the inspiration from War of the Spark. Though, people had some concerns about War of the Spark. We'll talk about that in, in a minute, because you have done some things to kind of address those. The two mechanics, Breach and Encounter, feed into lessening each other's design issues, too. They do. This is cool. Pushing Breach makes for a repetitive gameplay where some cards will get recurred again and again, and once you run out of removal, you lose out on interaction to deal with them. But Encounter makes it so you don't need hard removal to interact with these cards since you can swing at them with creatures. On the other hand, Encounter is at its core a card disadvantage mechanic, as the opponent can use zero resources, a creature they already have, to take an Encounter down. By having it be tied to a recursion mechanic, Breach, you can more freely play encounters, even with some risk. We will get back to that later, but overall, yeah, I think clever. Uh, scrolling around a little bit. The encounter mechanic will also be used on a generic token with the same feel as Decayed Zombies in Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Yeah, let's show this, actually. Um, Blue-black supported archetype is horror matters uh, type creatures, which then also ties in naturally with abnormality cards that appear in every color. So you can see that this card says uh, Glimpse into the Well. It's a three mana black instant. It says each player mills three, then you may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And remember that the abnormality cards will be creatures in your graveyard because their front face, well, they're both, both faces are creatures, but the front face is creatures. If you milled a horror card this way, create a 3-2 black horror token with encounter 1. So here you can see it appear. It's a 3-2, but during your opponent's turn, it becomes a battle you protect with only one counter on it. Um, so it's easy to kill in that way, much like the decayed zombies in Midnight Hunt indeed, because they died quickly, you know, if they engaged in combat too much. Um, cool. Yep. And there are other cards that here's a, a blue mana five blue mana uh, instant draw three cards and create a three two black core token with encounter one cool uh, a goal of these abnormality cards is to bring back some standalone mechanics that fit flavorfully to abnormality gimmicks across project moon's games so the snow queen which we'll get into in a minute is representing a gimmick where she freezes agents that get kissed by her and can only be saved by sending another agent into duel you go inside the abnormality and duel them Definitely want to make them have a similar feeling as Future Sight cards. You know, we'll come back to that later, actually. Um, I think these are somewhat down to earth so far. And of course, I don't want to make the cards purely references to Project Moon's games. Cards like this teddy bear I've designed as Magic's Bear, a 2-2 creature for 2 mana, that also has a group hug element to it. I definitely want nostalgia and familiarity to be a design focus, even for Magic players who've never played a Project Moon game. Overall, I really like where I've landed as an overarching set gimmick, thinking of ways each color has to bin cards, looting, milling, surveilling, sacking, casting instants and sorceries, has been a very helpful technique to come up with slightly different comments from the usual. I have a second battle mechanic that creates a battle token for the opponent to protect, and a handful of new evergreen or deciduous keywords to help push damage. 
The upcoming Modern Horizons 3 set randomly ended up having two overlapping set themes, Energy and Modified, which is annoying, but I think these abnormality cards as well as new battle designs will keep the set feeling different. Now that my short introduction is done, I want to know what sort of classic magic effects you could see working well with the encounter mechanic. Some keywords like Vigilance and Reach simply don't work because they can't block, they're not creatures when they're on your opponent's turn. While effects like Indestructible and Hexproof have a lot more nuance when used with Encounter, since opponents can kill bombs with these keywords by directly attacking them, what old magic keywords would be fitting for abnormalities you know from Limbus Company? Sure, a complicated parlay, uh, but I think manageable. I will admit off the bat that I will not likely be very good at naming some abnormalities from Limbus Company and then adapting them into magic cards. I think doing that and having it be satisfying would take most of a parlay in and of itself. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the other parts because I have more to say, and if we get into that, you know, it'll happen. But uh, this is a long parlay, so I hope you don't mind me picking and choosing the things I think I can say something about. Yes, I want to start with the indestructible and hexproof thing. I think that going back to what you said about it kind of solving the design limitations of each half of the mechanic, uh, you've got a recursive effect, and to prevent it getting repetitive, you well, it kind of might get repetitive, but you can kill them uh, when they're recurred with just creature attacks. Uh, that that whole thing. Um, I personally feel like a a problem that uh, War of the Spark had is that the influx of planeswalkers was it was just planeswalkers. You know, we we got a ton more of a card type we don't normally get, but the, a couple of things. First of all, it was planeswalker, which is a card type that has a lot more upkeep. You've got to keep track of loyalty for every single one. It's another ability you choose to use every turn at a separate time from attacking. Another creature, you might choose to attack or block with that other creature, but you choose to attack with your creatures at the same time during a turn. It doesn't increase complexity too much, whereas I think Planeswalkers really do add an extra mental step. Uh, this is something I think is really underexplored when people think about having fun with Magically Gathering. It's something I think even the designers are a little weak on and we could talk about why another time, which is just the mental load of adding certain effects to the game. Here, though, I think that you've done something interesting where kind of two things. One is that the, the, the extra mechanic is a creature half of the time. The abnormalities are creatures half of the time, and they're interacted with by creatures the other half of the time. So you're keeping the mental load contained to a part of the game that already normally happens, especially in Limited. Okay, and then two, the, the weird card type, you're populating the set with way more battles than normal, but the way you interact with battles is with creatures, and all of the battles are also creatures. So quite elegantly, we're kind of limiting the problematic nature of flooding the set with, you know, uh, battles or whatever. And it will have a different theme where you're still going to attack a lot, but rather than blocking you know, you have lots of threats on the board. So if I have an abnormality that, and you're attacking into me, you might choose to just kill me, but I get more damage against you and ability to kill your attacking creature if it's an abnormality if you don't kill my abnormality. So every turn, you're kind of choosing, are you going to go for the throat or try to kill off blockers to, you know, stem the bleeding or whatever. Uh, try to kill off potential attackers. It's confusing to think about because normally I think of, I'm kind of thinking of the abnormalities as blockers, but they're sort of not. But you see what I mean? Your opponent's choosing if they want to kill your creature that's right now an encounter, or if they want to go face. And then if they just go face, you can use your encounter that they didn't kill as a creature to kill their creature when it turns into an encounter. Thus, I feel like normal creatures will be really strong and of course, we have normal creatures uh, at home. They're the front side of the abnormality cards. Just to go back to one again, because I know the way I just described it was terrible and made no sense and just confused everyone. You know, if, if we have a bunch of Scorched Match Girls in both of our decks, when they're the abnormality side, we can attack into each other and kill off each other's Scorched Match Girls. I'll attack you and target your now in encounter form Scorched Match Girl and kill it directly killing your creature in a way you normally can't in magic. Or I could go for your face and do damage to you directly. But if I do that, on your turn, your Scorched Match Girl that that didn't, you know, die, 
uh, can kill off mine, or vice versa. Again, I don't know if I'm just mixing people up. I, I can't keep that straight in my head, but you get the point. You can pick off each other's threat uh, by trading back and forth in a way different from normal magic, but which does seem balanced. I, I am tempted to say that I feel like that's so different from normal magic gameplay that there is sort of a thing there worth mentioning, but we'll just mention it. It doesn't mean the entire idea is bad. Um, this is a, a sort of on-the-side, universes beyond style experience. It's not so weird for it to feel a little different, but this does fundamentally change a mechanic about how magic feels to play. And so related to this sort of mental load or just the mental aspect of magic in general, it might be that a lot of people who like magic won't like this in the same way, because a core aspect of the game, giving the blocking, defending player a lot of control, has been sort of removed. It hasn't been completely removed. Um, you, you know, if you have a creature that's a creature during your opponent's turn, that's very powerful because your abnormality creatures are not creatures during your opponent's turn. The ability to block <laughs> is at a kind of premium in this set. I would imagine being able to make multiple small tokens, if they can be blockers, would be very, very, very strong in this set. Um, because of the simple ability to block, a token you can redeem for being able to engage in the blocking step in combat, uh, would be a pretty big deal, would be scarce in, in this set. So... Uh, that's something to be careful of. I, I'm not sure I wouldn't include those things. I feel like while we have a lot of creatures to help offset, you know, we have a bunch of new creatures in the set that can't block, basically, it might be that you need even more of them. You know, I was excited to hear, and I'll be excited to hear about how the playtesting goes, because this is a set where I feel like the exact balance that will work well of creatures to abnormality creatures that basically can't block is going to be very tricky. Uh, is I guess my my takeaway thought. It might be even more than we think, but I think it's clever that you kind of dodge some of the War of the Spark problem uh, already. You clearly thought about that a lot before putting this mechanic in. And it sounds cool, it's something different. Uh, as for mechanics that interact with it, that was kind of the meat of your question. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about are a few that you included. So we're going to look specifically at greater length at Wayward Passenger and the Snow Queen, because you used on them a couple mechanics that I want to talk about a little bit. Can we can I make this bigger easily? I don't normally use this, so oh yeah, here we go. This is this is nice. Uh, all right, that'll eh, that's pretty janky. There we go. Okay, um, so here you can see for a specific example. Wayward Passenger uses energy uh, as kind of a callback to charge in the game. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna read the whole card. Uh, it's a 3-1 for 3 in uh, Demir colors with flash. And it says, whenever Wayward Passenger deals combat damage, you gain that much energy. And then the breach cost is 5 and 4 cards exiled as a sorcery. Then the encounter, the, the abnormality half, the breached half is a 3-7 with encounter 3, so on your opponent's turn, it's a battle you defend with 3 counters on it. It says, whenever a horror creature you control deals combat damage, you gain that much energy. So it retains the effect from before, it is still a horror, but it works for all horrors. You said the blue-black theme was horrors. Um, and then it says, when Wayward Passenger enters, pay X energy. When you do, put a creature card exiled by it for its breach cost with mana value X or less onto the battlefield, except it's a black horror with encounter three in addition to its other types. So when you use Wayward Passenger, you get to bring like a passenger with you. Uh, that is one of the creatures, uh, one of the things you breached uh, using its breach cost, you exiled. You have to pay energy to bring it back. And then you're getting more energy as you go, which means that future Wayward Passengers will be able to bring back even bigger stuff, probably. You'll probably be generating a lot of energy off of this, and the creature you bring back is now a horror, so it generates energy. But it's also an encounter, so you can attack it directly. It can be directly killed. These kinds of snowballing mechanics, I think in general, are made a little bit more manageable by that fact that your opponent can just attack into them. Summoning Sickness is really rough, Right? Like if you play this and then the you know you pay the energy and you know get the creature back, your opponent next turn 
before you can attack with those two things, can swing into both Wayward Passenger and the other Horror, or prioritize Wayward Passenger, since it's the one that generates the energy, and just kill it. Now, you can breach it again, but four cards exiled and five mana adds up. That's a big tempo cost. And if you didn't get any more energy, then it doesn't particularly do that much for your opponent to bring it back. You can just keep attacking into it. So they're interesting. It feels like to get this card to play well, you need to generate a tempo swing moment where you can sacrifice the slowdown to kind of get it going. And you can see what I mean about blockers. Suddenly it gets really out of control if you get to attack just a few times, but if you can't get it off the ground, it doesn't particularly do much unless your creature you're resurrecting has an enters the battlefield effect or whatever, uh, you know, when you put it into play. So yeah, I, I, I like these on premise. And you might have noticed something in there. A lot of the balance of Wayward Passenger comes from the fact that you can't generate energy another way, or at least not too much energy generated another way. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's look at Snow Queen. It says, when the Snow Queen enters, put an ice counter on another permanent you control. It becomes a snow land with tap to add one mana, and it would be a snow mana for as long as you control the Snow Queen. You can pay one snow mana and tap to tap target creature. Pretty good rate for a tap ability, especially on a 2-3-4-3, three, three, already a good defensive creature in Azorius colors. The breach costs are the same, four cards and five mana, and it becomes a 4-5 with encounter three. When the Snow Queen enters, put an ice counter on target permanent and opponent controls without one, becomes a snow land with tap to add one uh, for as long as you control the Snow Queen. No more than one creature can attack the Snow Queen each combat. I like this design, just as an aside. I like that the thing that enables its utility ability on the creature side, the normal creature side, is then mirrored as a negative thing on the abnormality breach side. Uh, you turn one of your permanents into a snow land so you can pay for the tap ability, but then that becomes a removal effect that you use in your opponent's stuff when you use the abnormality or the breach side of the card. And then it powers itself up. No more than one creature can attack it, but you could have eliminated one of their creatures by, uh, you know, turning it into a, 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 a snow land. I'm not totally clear on that part, actually. So the way you have it worded at the moment, I, I believe the creature would still be a creature. It would just also be a snow land. I think that you mean it to be like that it is, it's frozen. It's kind of stuck. You know, the, the creature can't attack anymore. Uh, but it doesn't have the clause where it says uh, it loses all other types or whatever. It's possible you intended that or not, I don't know. Um, I think it'd be cool if it was intended. Though this card seems pretty powerful um, overall. Anyway, you're beginning to see the point I was making before. This card is more balanced if there are not other snow effects in the set. Now, it is a, a set you could draft, and the Snow Queen is not a legendary creature, though, well, we'll get back to that. And so you, you, I guess, could get other sources of snow from other Snow Queen cards. And I think it's probably okay if there are a few more snow things in the set, but I think these cards get more balanced if you use them as a way to kind of splash a little of the effect. And I like the idea that it then benefits you if you go in deep on that effect a little bit. You will have snow mana to spend if you've been using the Snow Queen card. Uh, and then that means if you continue using it, if you persevere and find a way to get it to stick without your opponent just killing it right away, then you're in a good place. But then does that feed back into the repetitive gameplay loop thing? I think there's a balance, in other words, what I'm saying between how much you allow these mechanics like snow and energy to be in the set versus how much you let them be just that abnormalities thing and kind of let them have that let that let that be you know just a thing for that abnormality to enjoy uh, personally i'm leaning more on the latter i think it would be nice if these were more just things that you got from that one abnormality in the context of this set and then in broader magic people can make some crazy energy deck with you know, black blue horrors or whatever. This is one of the better payoffs for energy in Magic. Uh, Wayward Passenger is one of the stronger energy payoffs in the game if it were printed as a real card. So I'm not particularly worried that people are going to do something super OP 
if you make a ton of energy uh, in something like Commander. You have Aetherworks Marvel, you have that one whale, if I recall correctly, that's in blue. But I mean, it. I think it's mostly fine. Uh, and so I, I think in the context of the set, the balance would be more interesting if it was mostly something you get from that abnormality. But does that then make the, the mechanic play into itself too much? I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I feel like it it's interesting to try to get something to stick because simply playing Wayward Passenger over and over again with its breach cost, if it get if it keeps getting killed, just isn't effective. And so I don't think it's bad to offer a reward if you manage to do that. It feels like you're fighting or pushing back the abnormality a little bit, which sounds kind of fun to me. I don't think it will feel repetitive as per se. It will mean that it's very difficult to get value out of a lot of abnormalities because you're probably going to be fighting to get value out of any one at any time trying to breach something else, we'll just be paying the same cost for less of a promise of a benefit. If you have a lot of energy, you might as well go for the Wayward Passenger. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the, I, I feel mixed about it. I kind of like that that's a sort of self-limiting factor. If you don't do something to back up the abnormality, it won't get off the ground, and then your resources are kind of trapped. You can't get as much of a benefit out of your energy or whatever you built up. But at the same time, I'm worried that that's going to encourage you to just play the same thing, or it's going to be really bad. You're going to play other cards to support playing the same abnormality over and over again, but it's going to be really bad to play other abnormalities in the same deck. You might They might end up in your graveyard, but you just won't want to invest in them. It will make more sense to invest in the one that you've already got going a little. So I don't know. Um... I mean, you, there could be very few. That's the thing, right? Like, with, without the full set in front of us, it might be that I'm imagining way more abnormalities than there is. Let's go back to that part where you talked about that a little. Dub 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 dub. Every abnormality card will be a, a, a double face card with breach in the front, encounter in the back. Every pack will have a dedicated slot with a low rarity abnormality card. Every so every pack has one. And another card will be replaced with another abnormality card of the same rarity. So it could be a, a variety of rarities. So that means each pack has two, maybe. Thus, let's say you play limited. You have, I guess, six in the three packs you opened for draft. And going around the table, you might pick, you know, on average around six or, you know, four to seven or eight would be reasonable, right? Which is a lot, I think. Four is not that many. Um, but seven or eight, you know, a good amount of your deck, uh, if you focused on them, could be abnormalities. Um, I guess in limited, it's not too bad because you can't mill yourself that easily. That's another thing. I don't know how much you care about this, but in other formats where you can mill yourself in a more robust way, I feel like Breach is much less balanced. You know what I mean? Playing normal magic, the exile cards from graveyard cost is meaningful, for sure. But in, in uh, Constructed, it's probably not. You know what I mean? Like, it, you'll be able to mill a lot, and people will use dredge or whatever, and mill a ton of cards, and the abnormalities will be uber powerful and almost impossible to destroy, because even if you were to exile one of them from your graveyard, you could just use your milling engine to mill into even more of them, because they could be played from your graveyard. Flashback creatures that you can continue flashing back from your graveyard is very scary. Now, they can't block... So that's something. Um, they, they don't allow you to just bail out infinite defenses against an opponent. But, I mean, they can attack. It's a, it's a very difficult threat to impose control on, I, it seems to me. They can kind of be killed in more ways, but not that many more. Um, that's another thing that was on my mind about the indestructible and hexproof thing. So they're, they're creatures and battles. Now, if they have indestructible and hexproof... It might be hard to target them with a destroy effect, but your point was that people can still use creature combat to kill them. But I feel like the type of deck that is going to struggle with these endlessly recurring themselves would be more like a controlling strategy that will use targeted removal that says destroy, thus indestructible and hexproof, or just not being a creature, is a big problem for those strategies. Board wipes won't kill them. You know, sorcery speed board wipes won't kill them. Sorcery speed anything basically won't kill them unless they have battle-specific counter stuff. Now, obviously, in the set I'm imagining, there's going to be lots of spells that say destroy target creature or battle or something like that. You could even say destroy target creature or battle with encounter, 
something like that that just destroys stuff from that set. Lots of sets have that. They have little commons that adapt to removal to work in the limited environment, and then in broader constructed, you can figure it out. That That's fine, I suppose. Another thing that came to mind is that the way abnormality cards normally work, they do not have a converted mana cost on the backside. So the Snow Queen here is a three converted mana cost card on the front and zero on the back, thus something like Abrupt Decay that just destroys any permanent with a converted mana cost three or less is very, that type of removal is very strong against these cards, this type of card. Um, Ratchet Bomb and its ilk, the cards that you kind of pay an amount of mana into, and then they blow up and destroy permanents that have this converted mana cost or this converted mana cost or less. There's a couple variants like that. Uh, Blast Zone, Ratchet Bomb, Karn Silix does something similar. Uh, the Filigree Silix is another Ratchet Bomb. You know, there, there are a lot of these effects, and a lot of those are artifacts. So in broader magic, there are a lot of ways to kind of abuse that part. It might be weirdly easy to destroy them, but maybe only with somewhat specialized removal, is I guess what I'm getting at. I'm not sure if that is good. Um, it depends on what environment. I mean, in a competitive constructed format, which this won't be in, I, I would imagine, uh, you know, that doesn't sound that healthy. It takes up a lot of sideboard slots that really only help a lot against this deck. People play, you know, Ratchet Bomb or whatever, but uh, not not that much. <laughs> they kind of don't, you know. Um, whereas in, you know, in a, in a smaller constructed format, you and your playgroup might be fine with that. It might be that if you play these in, oh, Commander decks, it will be sort of fun, like you'll know that it's useful, more useful than normal, to have Ratchet Bomb, uh, that one thing with Fraley's blowing up a bunch of stuff that's a black-green permanent that destroys cards with converted mana cost X, I can't remember. Um, Gaze, Gaze of Granite, I have a ton of these on my mind because these effects have always interested me. Things that destroy, you know, permanents that have a low converted mana cost, they're good against tokens, too. Uh, it might be that your playgroup will adapt to that just fine and it's fun. For me, I have a pod of commander decks that are all designed uh, with it very important to me that they're modular enough, that none of them do something that, because it's a set designed to be played against each other, I don't want one commander deck to be designed to do something that I know the other decks don't counter, of course. Uh, why would I do that? But it's the same thing in this case, where to some extent, these cards will become like artificially kind of boom-bust, because the way you counter them is sort of not harder or easier, but just different than other cards. If you target your opponent's graveyard with graveyard hate, these are kind of weak to a type of graveyard hate that a lot of graveyard strategies are not weak to, which is spot removal of your graveyard. Um, if you remove only a few cards from someone's graveyard, you pick and choose through their graveyard. These can be weirdly useful those can be weirdly effective against these strategies in a way they normally aren't as effective. Dredge or a deck that's going big on milling its graveyard out, milling its deck out into its graveyard, uh, they often don't mind as much if you pick and choose cards to remove. They are worried about you knocking out their whole graveyard. And normally those pick and choose cards are better against like, oh, your opponent has a flashback spell and you get rid of it and they lose a little value, but it's not that bad. Whereas against these abnormalities, those spells are very good. Those It's really, really strong to play like Scavenger Goose or something that just picks and chooses one card from your graveyard, normally a small effect for a small cost, repeatable on an efficient body. It could be very scary. Um, and that type of, again, I would say sort of boom-bust mechanic where it's either really, really good or it can be shut down by something kind of mundane can be frustrating uh, to play with against. It's not the end of the world, uh, just something that I thought I'd bring up. You might say, I'm planning to play mostly limited, or when I play with my, my playgroup, we know each other well, we just won't abuse that. Yeah, like that's cool, you know, great. Uh, that's That would be my solution too. Uh, but I would say in a broader context, I think players of Magic in general would, would rip this to pieces, you know. Um, they would start going crazy with aggro decks that would make it so you would never untap to be able to swing with an abnormality, and they, your graveyard would be picked to smithereens, and you could play, I don't know, like Jund aggro or something would, 
you know, destroy a lot of this set's design. And I don't think that means you shouldn't have fun with it, um, is I guess what I'm saying. It might sound like this is intended to be criticism, but it's not really. I mean, I'm saying I feel like there is a problem in broader magic, which I feel like is much of what is interesting to discuss about this, but I just don't think that's a reason not to have fun with these. That problem, it kind of kicked down the road, is an issue for lots of playgroups playing lots of types of magic. So uh, I don't think it's a huge deal. Do I have a ton of specific mechanics in mind that specifically interact with abnormalities designed as you have in ways you haven't thought of? No. Do I have an idea for how to adapt you know, abnormalities from Limbus Company into magic cards on top of reading the whole parlay and commenting on the design of the set as a whole, I, I don't. So in a way I feel bad because I, I can't easily answer the, the proper question of this parlay, but do I have a lot to say about it? I do, I think this is a cool idea. Um, it's fun to think about how you can use magic's mechanics to tell a story and tell the story of another piece of media while still making them a fun magic mechanic. That's something I really appreciated about this. And in a way is kind of the fun thing about universes beyond, even though I it's a topic for another time, but I'm not really a fan is that a lot of the cards are interesting. They're interesting adaptations of magic's mechanics to kind of mimic the flavor of something else. Um, for example, something I really liked in the Lord of the Rings one was how they use the amass mechanic from more of the spark. Something I've personally always kind of liked the idea of, a token mechanic that builds up one single big token instead of a bunch of small ones and maybe powers it up, representing a whole army crashing in. And they turn that into a mass orcs instead to represent, you know, the, the, the obviously from Lord of the Rings, the orcs. Guess what creature? <laughs> um, that's cool. I think that that was a neat idea. Uh, that type of adaptation where it's a fun way to reuse an interesting mechanic in Magic, but it also meshes with the story, not compromising on either, not prioritizing storytelling, but the gameplay is kind of, huh? And not prioritizing gameplay, but then the storytelling is, uh, it just has a picture of the thing from the game on it. It's kind of doing both well. And I personally think you did a good job doing both too. They're reasonable Magic cards, and they evoke the storytelling of the effects from the games, at least the ones I'm familiar with. Um, Wayward Passenger made me think, yeah, cool. Like you sort of evoked some of the effects of Hong Lu's Wayward Passenger uh, ego and the abnormalities mechanics in general. Like that's that's neat. That's a cool idea. Um, I get. I see the fun personally. I usually hate this kind of thing. I hope I hope that doesn't come across the wrong way. I'm having fun with these. But normally I I don't like when the the custom sets folks make. I don't often see the fun. To me it's like there's already enough work to make magic be fun at all in the first place. Let alone, you know, if you add in your own custom effects that aren't, you know, whatever amount of playtesting they still do over at Wizard of the Coast. Um I I'm often not that excited to just add new things into the mix but i think these seem kind of fun um it, it's interesting too because it's such a different mechanic um it is hard to think about balancing it the, the, the abstract thinking required is kind of different um when the creature has encounter four is that a lot is that not that much you know i feel like you keeping them low is wise because i'm looking at this card um because if, you're, if your opponent has multiple of these and their life total, you're attacking with a few creatures, yeah, but you're dividing them among three targets. You know, having encounter four means a medium-sized creature may not kill this in one hit. That's a lot. And another way to look at it is you kind of gain that much life in a way if your opponent attacks it. Um, if they don't, if they don't let you gain that much life, then you know, or if they don't, if they don't let you have the creature, then you gain that much life. So you're giving, it's like one of those modal cards, you know, either I gain four life or I get a four, four that when it attacks, taps up to one creature and must be blocked each turn of able, you know, that whole thing. Um, just interesting. Like I, that, that creates a whole different game dynamic. And I've always liked those cards, the cards that are like, uh, you know, you, your opponent has to pick which one of two bad things happen to them. But because they get to pick, the bad things are really bad. Like uh, Mayhem Devil maybe comes to mind. Is that what it's called? Vexing Devil. It's a one mana red creature. It's a 4-3, I think. 
And when it comes into play, your opponent can choose to just take four damage, and then it dies, or they give you the four three. Uh, four damage for one mana is a better rate than you normally get. And a four three for one mana is crazy, but they can choose to not give you the four three. And so because they get the choice, it gets to be pushed a little bit. I have a feeling that is okay here, but then it, but the, the number of uh, encounter defense counters the encounter number shouldn't be the thing that goes high it should be that the creature is pushed overall um, and then their chance to counter it is you know not too hard i don't know uh, it's tricky i i i again it's also like the the surrounding set and how much you can get stuff in the graveyard is interesting i i wanted to get back before we before we end to what you said about each color's way of getting cards in the graveyard um, and you said casting instants and sorceries. I thought that was very clever. The spell slinger thing that blue red often does, you can get a bunch of cards in your graveyard. But then we see with some abnormalities, they're going to care what you exile for their breach cost. Like Wayward Passenger wants it to be that there's a creature in there to get full value. So that that's an interesting tension as well. You mentioned looting, milling, surveilling, sacking, casting instants and sorceries. Um, yeah, I mean, I like the idea of just cantrips too. Uh, creatures and spells that when you play them they they don't do much but they draw you a card back are suddenly really good because just having more of the cards in your deck you know engaged makes abnormality cards much stronger you know you have more cards that could be exiled a creature at all you know and then it replaces itself is really good you know that thing green gets often where it's like a two mana one one and you draw a card uh, is so good in this set because you get a blocker at all like that itself is very powerful and uh, a cantripping effect would be good anyway getting a creature out of it is really really strong in this format i think um so i don't i don't know i i hope this was still satisfying i i don't think i'm not ashamed to admit that i don't think i'm going to be able to think of specific mechanics or or specific abnormalities better than you would think of them i feel like my ability is going to be more to comment on the game as a whole and thinking about the format it creates and the mentality it'll create in players so i hope that was still fun uh i this is a, a challenging type of parlay to do but i enjoyed seeing the abnormality cards uh, i spent half of the parlay just staring at them because it's satisfying um they're cool uh, i hope you let us know how the playtesting goes too looking forward to the next one folks if you enjoyed these parlay you can figure out how to get your own or just watch more of them down in the description Talk to you soon. Looking forward to the next one.